Welcome, everybody. It's June 28th, back for another Node Operator Roundtable, and I'll hand it over to Brian. Thank you. Um, so today, we don't have a update per se on uh, the Leap side of things. Um, however, I will say that what's going on behind the scenes right now is some um, reworking of the 5.0 release to, to be able to come back with dates um, for when we intend to have a release candidate ready. Um, we're uh, we're kind of early in the process of, of reworking based on some uh, some shifts recently um, with you know the resources working on the project. So, um, but soon I, I should be able to um, you know come back and and give an update on what we intend to include in the five release. Um, and when we intend to have a release candidate available. And as part of that, uh, you know, begin those discussions that, that need to happen sooner rather than later about uh, sort of the process for um, it, making, you know, consensus upgrades occur because what will what we do know for sure about 5.0 is that it will include um, at least one consensus um you know protocol feature upgrade um and yeah so that's coming soon uh stay tuned with that uh i don't have a set agenda for today uh so we're gonna go open floor and um hear out people's uh topics of interest and then um after a few minutes of that we will choose one to dive into. Michael, I'm going to call on you because it sounded like you already had one of, of interest that you might want to talk about. <laughs> I, I have a topic we've been discussing, but that was more kind of a depth. I am curious. I know we're still kind of fighting some of the, I don't want to say core issues with four and you know some of the major overhauls and just some of the quirks that are still being worked out. I think four of three it even still has a little bit and then crazy to hear us talking about 5.0 RC1 because a lot of us haven't even shifted a large majority of our critical infrastructure over yep um and then what ends up happening you know we end up kind of like with 3.1 and 3.2 you had this we're still fixing some of the cores in four but really it's happened to get cross applied five and then there kind of becomes this dual line in the sand to be like oh yeah i don't know it just gets it's great to see the progress but it's almost like it damn we haven't even finished <laughs> the dust settling on 4.0 and we're already going to be rolling into rc for a five yeah that's that's valid um and we might that might be the topic we talk about i'm not going to dive into it yet just in case there are other topics folks want to cover and uh and we end up choosing something else uh, but that might be what we go into. Um, anyone else? Um, it just reminded me, Michael was saying how he has to snip the block slug. Um, I've, I had an issue. Uh, power went off on the nose. Um, and often when that happens, you have to always trim the last few, you know, 100 blocks or 50 blocks or whatever. And I was trying to use leap util um and i uh, had some issues i ended up having to use esi block log tool or the original one esi log yeah you know, the, the old one and that worked and i took some i took some screenshots um and i if you let me share a screen i'll just show you what the difference is if you if you want to see it otherwise i'd be good uh, share screen One, two. Okay, so the first thing is I tried to run a normal smoke test. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, we see the JPEG. Not super. See, it's not super. Now we see your window. But it's, uh, okay. At least the white text we can read and not so much the red. Okay. okay, so the first thing you do to know whether it's broken, when you're expecting it to be broken, you just want to make sure you just go and you run a smoke test. 
And the smoke test um, using leap util isn't as nicely laid out as the smoke test on the original. Show you how smoke she yeah so this one again shows me all nice exactly what's going on first block last block there's an exception there's a disagreement with the block log uh, and i just know that i used to have to clip off the last few so you can see it's giving me similar kind of information here uh it's saying that there's an error but it doesn't tell me what the first and what the last is. okay so this is using LeapUtil, and this is using the ESIO block log. Then I thought, okay, that's cool. And I can see that it's broken, right? Uh, so let me go off and trim the blocks log. So what I did is then I went and tried to do a similar command. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Similar command, LeapUtil block log. That's the directory. And I just wanted to trim up to that veteran. block. Yeah. So then it says, okay, then it says that uh, the first field is required. Okay. So then I went and put in the first field. Sorry, one moment. Block slug two. I went and said, okay. So I want to keep from one to you know 313 million and then it came up with a block log exception similar to how it when the smoke test was originally run okay you might need the block number two no the beginning because first okay. mm, i'm not well, sure though it was this was i mean it, my idea like the user experience of the syntax i want to keep basically everything okay so you might be right i didn't try that but what it I did, does say you know that the first block in the log is one. So I, I mean, okay. two may work, but one, it always thought there was a block one in there from yeah. the original. So this, that, yeah, that would be dead. Okay, but see, but, no, but you, you see, this smoke test is very clear. Mm -hmm. This smoke test is like, okay, something's broken. You know what I mean? Like, okay. So then what I did is I just went in and ran it. This is, a, it's a four node, but just running the old tool. And I just trimmed it and boop, boop, trims off the last few, all working great. Yep. And that's what I have so, to do. And what happens yeah. if it hours off, if it runs out of space, if it crashes, um, if the node goes unresponsive, just anything, there's, I don't know, Ralph, what would you say? Maybe a 30, 40% chance that it, it stops. I already get this. If the node gets powered off and like, I don't know, memory isn't flushed to disk or whatever, whatever, you know, and glad you get it. And it rock. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like if my provider turns off a node abruptly or, um, the power goes off in our data center, it happened a couple of times. So I, I kind of expect to do it. And, uh, interestingly enough, if the, if it runs, if it runs low on disk space and it does the graceful micro shutdown, then there's no problem. <laughs> it dumps into disk. I, look, I, I saved you a few of these, but yeah, that I haven't even had to run into that. But that—that's one yeah. of the reasons why we're so. I, I am so scared. I run into that a lot because I don't run ECC because I run i nine rig. So my host will just clip out <laughs> more frequently. Well, I think, you know. this is this is ECC. This is an ECC. Correct. I mean, you're, but that's why you only notice it when it powers off. But for the sake of the argument, it's not just the power off. If if for and it's got to be memory related. That's what everybody keeps telling me. But if it hits a bad block and it basically crushes my whole Ubuntu node, and well, ultimately there were nine state history instances that every single one of them I had to do this exact same thing, and I did relay and the and you're concerned. Oh, go ahead, sir. And like, is the is the goal, for example, to auto do a smoke test on Node EOS launch, and then grab say last block uh, that is working or at least what's reported by the tool, and then go back I don't know whatever number of blocks before it, and that way you can start Node EOS with like an auto trim option, and you specify how many blocks behind, 
And that way if your server restarts and automatically like you have not your start as a service, then in theory that should take care of it. You can do it. I mean, kind of in my head and it's pretty consistent. I don't know what line of code it's hitting, but it's some producer unpack a b does not equal a, a or something like that it's something uh, it, it, it always say that the producer schedule is mismatched correct, or something correct. Like it's like it, it it's the a schedule consistent yeah very vague error and those of us that break shit all the time are like oh yeah i gotta go trend the block log but yeah so that in itself if it were able to error handle or kind of detect that and really if you just go back i go back a couple thousand blocks but you uh, definitely can't go back just a few like you would think. Oh, the last one or two. Yeah. Nah, man, you got to go back a couple hundred or a thousand yeah. and just, you know, be done and make sure it's still within your snapshot because you'll go back and be like, yeah, that snapshot is 10 blocks after. Either down yeah. so you go back based on reversible blocks or, or what are you at? Uh, that's probably, I mean, the 300 block uh, reversible is probably what's health dictating that. That's probably about yeah. the point, but if the point I, is, yeah, then, uh, it's, I, I just routed it down. It's like, I had to off a thousand, but that I'm going to get 340 shooting or whatever, but you're right. 140 blocks. Yeah. It's yeah. also not guaranteed. It could be longer. Like, so, so my oh, dog likes oh. to break things and apparently I never break it this way. I never have this problem. You're going to start all this side wrong to roll back. And I never need to roll back. Go, go turn one off. Just go and pull the plug. Oh, the hell? Trust me, our data center provider has been very good at just randomly turning off machine. So uh, let me let me let me log into your nodes. I'll take care of it. Do you use snapshots? Uh, yeah, but but I'm I'm using ZFS. All the block logs are on ZFS. So ZFS is protecting me. Yeah, I the say ZFS. You're using ZFS. I don't know. My, my, my. I, I say ZFS. Okay, ZFS. I suppose it's I still buy that file system. Anger root. ZFS, sh I should say that too, but in Canada. It sounds better, like zebra. No, zebra. <laughs> zebra. So, so it, it's kind of twofold. I mean, number one, and we were just kind of generally chatting about this, I think in some discussion about kind of normal error handlings for node operators. And trust me, Regular node operators shut that shit down in properly way more than Matthew does. I promise that. But it was really kind of, uh, hey, if it could error handle this, that might actually take out why Ross and I are constantly having to go back and trim the last 500 blocks or whatever to get past whatever the quirk is. Then, because we have to do this all the time... <laughs> Ross ran into, oh, crap, that lead util is definitely deprecated some features, so it would be really nice to have those back, or at least work, because it's still going to happen, right? I mean, I'm still going to break shit. I'm still going to have to trim the log. State history is beautiful. It'll snap right back in line. As long as you don't get any gaps, it'll fix itself. It takes 12 hours. <laughs> It'll fix itself, but man, that block log can get jacked. So there's really kind of two issues. Now I'm going to, yeah, th that's where I want to unpack. Um, this is the explain it like I'm five situation. I, I, I uh, sent a message to Kevin uh, that I don't think he saw where I said, are you following this? Because it's over my head. <laughs> um, so what I want to do now is like uh, try to distill the problems in the explain it like I'm five sort of... Uh, language here so i picked up on a couple of themes but i want to get really specific with them so one is the formatting and contents of the leap util error message right um particularly with the uh smoke test right but maybe in general smoke test and trim yeah just doesn't seem to work like the old utility used to work yep and then there's the the need to roll back and trim the blocks log in the first place is maybe a problem um the same percent yeah Correct. Yeah. Correct. So yeah, let's with those. Let's unpack those one at a time, and then see if I've actually covered everything. So, what exactly is the issue with the uh, formatting and contents of the error? Message? Okay. Yeah. So in in the in the there's some the, yeah. there's improvements in the latest four or X. I don't know if you're or what version of four are you? That is four. Yeah. Or what? Uh, I don't know. 
<laughs> because I, I thought there was some changes in 402, 401. It might, it might be 401, probably 401. Yeah, we did make some improvements to um, uh, put that more like the ESIO version in terms of reporting there. In terms of hitting all the use cases you point out there, I, I'm not sure that, that we that we did that. Um, I would encourage you, you know, if you can just throw all those screenshots into a GitHub issue right quick, you know, we could uh, look at it because I, I think it definitely we want to just go and, and, and try the various things that you're doing there and see if we can't get it, uh, yeah, you know, on part. And I thought, I'll show you both. I'll show you both the old and the new. And yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. It's just, you know, we, uh, we've we apparently kind of regressed a little bit there in terms of its functionality, get that fixed up. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, one's a display and the other's the functionality to trim it. Yeah. Now, the other thing, yeah, the other thing that's interesting is the that you can't just chop off the last block, um, which is... Um, it's, which is a little interesting to me. It seems like it should always just be the last block. Um, you guys, that's are circumstantial like, though. Not, nobody has, yeah. been, like, I just, yeah, it I, could be. I, I'll be honest, I feel pretty confident that no, you can't trim one, you can't trim 10. I've broken a lot of these a lot of ways. You got to go well, there, because it's it's a full block, block your mic and live in and lock and mic not existing. That that's exactly. I wonder if that, well, it, 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 three hundred was the magic number. Three hundred. Well, it can't. It can't be that because we only put irreversible blocks in the block log. That's the only thing that's in the block log. So they don't get written. Now they do get written in a burst because when LIB moves, it doesn't just move one. It moves um, whatever it moves, like a dozen or so. So it, it could be related to to that. Maybe it's uh, maybe you have to trim off at least. Um, a dozen. I, I I don't know. That that's that's interesting. Or it's probably more related to like the disk block size, uh, not block log, but not not blocks in 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 our in our term, but blocks in terms of like the disk block. Um, in in, in it, I'll say yeah, this: it's different. consistent enough that you know I run multiple instances on the same node. That yeah. when it happens to one, it has pretty much happened to every single chain on that node now they may all be doing the same thing at the tops of the seconds and that's why they all are at the same state but you know like i mean i, I gotta believe like in the process of these half second cycles they would be at different points i mean writing an eos block has got to be way more than writing a <laughs> like a four block or something like that right so that's why i'm like i don't know why but I can guarantee you nine on the exact, and, and they're all on the same EFC four or disk. It, it's a dedicated disk. But anyway, so yeah, I mean, the other thing we could do, like we for a state history, like we sync, um, we do the sync call to, to flush it to disk. We don't do that for the block log, but you know, we could potentially do that. I'm trying to think. I, I at some point we moved that to a different thread. I don't know if that's actually leak code or only the ESIO code. I have to go take a look at that to to remember, but. Uh, we could uh, we could potentially do that, which which might help. Uh, but re regardless, um, you know, being it, it, no matter what you do, there's the potential for for a corruption unless we actually do a, a complete file system sync. But that's so slow, I I don't think we want to do that. And I've had it eat the files, you know, where it's just like it tries to validate it and it says, "Nah, man, this thing's bad." You know, it, this is. And Brian, to catch you up, we I guess kind of progressed from why you need to you know why Roz is trying to do something and it's not working he's trying to trim it and fix it right. and what kevin kind of picked up on is is well can you just roll back one or two blocks no well ultimately you know that's more why in the world would you have to roll back a couple hundred blocks since it, but that's more related to me is but i don't think it's the batch because of the batch, I assume even if it's batching, it's kind of batching it kind of like atomically, where like it only writes like the update and uh, last block after the last, you know, uh, item in the batch directly, but might be related to the other items you mentioned. Maybe we could add a like dash dash rewind command, which then just let's remove one, let's remove another one, let's remove another one. And then it keeps removing it until it finds, oh, now we're good. That's why I was like, I mean, I would think that if it could do so, it was like, I'm not handling. 
Well, or I mean, ultimately, it or maybe it would tell you where exactly it's the problem. So that way we can diagnose this, uh, you know, where did it get corrupt problem? Right, because right now, Michael, you just say, oh, just trim a thousand because I don't want to. I don't care. Don't look at it. Right. I know it's got to be more than one. Right. That's, right. That's... So if we have a tool that could like dissect where the problem happened, then every time you go to repair it, you could run this and then we could get some data that tells us actually how many blocks it's corrupt. But see, I guess in my mind, I look at it and say, the reason I run into this is because the node crashed, I'm firing it up. I'm using a snapshot. I'm trying to repair it. Right. And yeah, it, hangs because it's saying mm -mm, i don't like the data if it's going to start stepping its way back okay go to the block before the block before it maybe step in 12 if we think it's in batches whatever it is it if it would just be like cool there's the block that i need to start from and take it and go from there ross and i wouldn't have to be using the damn utility to begin sure with. even better that's what I say is that it's our handling of it and the tool to even figure out, well, where is it not broken at? Cool. Now that you figure that out, do it. <laughs> That's what I would Yeah, it's uh, this is a discussion more about auto repairing, which which I think is right. very useful in many things. Like, you know, you start with a snapshot. It should, you know, for example, delete your reversible and do those other things, uh, delete your state folder and automatically like some other tools, but they were built on top too. Uh, and that could fit right in there where I like Darwin's personally idea where you're not running a loop, which is generally just bad. You're more like finding a way through, you know, using a utility or something to find exactly where the block issue is. Either it returns it found it or not. And, and then the node decides uh, how to start. Yeah, but this has to be an optional parameter, right? Because... If you're on a network where you are the only block producer, the last thing you want to do is re auto remove blocks, right? But if you're on a public network, totally fine, remove blocks, whatever, because we can all- I get what you're saying, but in the context of that node, you're screwed because you can't use that block log anymore until- Yeah, but maybe it's so possible to extract some data out of that block log, I don't know. I'm just being. Well, that's what the tool will do anyway, right? Like the tool will find where is the last block that it can read correctly, and continue from there. So I guess even if you are your own producer, uh, lone In lone producer will still work. Although I do like it as an option because it does change functionality from what you are using. So kind of like a node BIOS option, like auto repair or something, and that would allow you to try those things automatically. Yeah, yeah. So I, I definitely like the option of. Do all the right things, and I don't care. Just start my node, you know, which is great for public networks. And for the private network where you're the only node on the whole network, well, don't run that option. It just, I mean, I get what you're saying, but, I mean, in my mind, this is only related to a snapshot restore, right? Because this is what it's trying to do. It's launched from a snapshot, and it's, it's going to try to replay the block log. But when it gets this unpack A doesn't equal B error... You're screwed. You're, I mean, I actually think, but you should have to detect that you, before. I think if you do a replay, if you had to do a whole replay and it got to the end of those blocks, the same it thing blows up. It blows yeah, up. I just still blow up. So it's not just it's that. Snapshot. It's not only snapshot. It, well, it's the snapshot, but then and it goes to replay after that. When it hits that last yeah, block, it let's say it that wrong. Let's say that you were, you know, insane. To replay an entire block log on one of the pub. Oh, actually, okay. You know what, Matthew? If you're running it on your private network and you, you know, you've only got a million blocks of that thing inside of them, when you replay it, if it's damaged, it's also going to damage. So, ultimately, yeah, for sure. Trim it regardless. Yeah. Correct. That's well, what I'd say is if you're restoring a snapshot and it knows that log, I mean, there, there's not much, unless maybe if you're running these super, I got to try to data harvest out of the corrupted block log. That should be the switch because from a user experience, there ain't nothing that makes sense about data unpack A doesn't equal B. So at least they're handling it. But really, that's why I say if you just go back a little bit, the whole snapshot recovery yeah. process can get that node fixed because your blocks are gone. There's no DOS itself. Like, uh, like one idea is no DOS itself could check the state of the block log before attempting to apply a snapshot, before attempting any of this thing. And then when it tries to apply a snapshot, it checks, okay, there's already a block slot, great. 
let's check if the snapshot takes place before or after the last corrupted and potentially decide uh, that way. Yeah, I mean, it pretty quickly figures out that it doesn't like the block log. So, I mean, it's not like you waste a lot of effort. You can fire it up and immediately you get an unpack error and then you no, know, no. Nope. So, um, but I mean, you could do it on startup, but in my opinion, it's kind of error handling of this snapshot or even the replay that says, mm -mm. So I want to bust my five-year-old understanding here. Okay. So uh, super high level, I mean, the the sort of uh, symptom thing, that, you know, going back to that is just sort of the, the error message and we've got an issue for that. And, you know, um, then the more fundamental issue here is that block logs get corrupted and ideally we would minimize the causes of block logs getting corrupted uh failing that we want an easy way to diagnose the cause of corrupted block logs um, and a way to more easily recover from corrupted block logs uh at at a ten thousand foot view is is my understanding right or am i missing the mark here yeah, I mean, yeah. if if you categorize yep. Yep. the message as, hey, your block logs corrupt like an error handling is one, yes. Then it got into the deeper discussion is if it could auto rotate. Mm -hmm. What's the, how many blocks back? Where would it be? The, the mechanics of. Well, yeah, and even auto rotate is a solution, but ultimately recovering when corruption occurs or preventing the corruption in the first place is what we're after, right? I, I'd probably say the former more so than the latter, you know, I mean, yeah, you, you'd love to prevent it, but you're probably not going to prevent Ross's servers getting powered off or you know, right. my memory collapsing. It's more in my opinion. Minimize corruption and make recovery super right. simple and potentially allow auto recovery. Two totally different things in my opinion. You can make them as two user stories if you want, but. Great. Um, I'd like to propose we move on uh, to other topics, um, uh, if that's all right. I, a topic occurred to me um, that actually I would like to get feedback on, but also I want to kind of keep the open floor first. So are there any other topics that folks want to cover? Michael had sort of release cadence uh, feedback and, and stuff that we could go into. Any other topics? Okay, I'll throw my topic out there, which is um, one one area that we're exploring as part of a larger initiative is um, attempting to, you know, which, I mean, this is one of those obvious and very large subjects, but attempting to reduce the, uh, the expenses involved in running a node. Um, and there's kind of two ways of looking at that, uh, which is, one, just in general, what what it takes to be a node operator for an Antelope network. And then um, another way of looking at it is incrementally, if you're a, you know, a block producer like many, most of the folks on this call, um, and you're running multiple Antelope chains, what's the, excuse me, what are the sort of uh, levers of the drive expense incrementally or, you know, adding one more Antelope network, you know. Um, does that make sense, what I'm saying? I think it's very specific to the Antelope network. But okay. in terms of improving the experience, I think it's a bit early to talk about this because the changes in, four point, you know, 4.x, like, you know, the, the multiple uh, threads and the read, you know, like, which are a lot of the actual calls, is already going to reduce... I think massively the number of say API uh, servers you need. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm not sure if it's potentially the right time since a lot of people still didn't migrate for and read those benefits to know where their new, um, where more they can minimize costs, for example. Yeah. And that's a fair point um, that, so maybe it makes sense to talk about that. Mm -hmm release cadence feedback first simply because 
that is uh, kind of goes directly to your point. Uh, so, yes. So the feedback, just to reiterate, um, sort of in case anybody's forgotten what Michael had said was, you know, hey, we're talking about 5.0, uh, but many of the node operators and even block producers have not necessarily upgraded to a 4.0 version. And they're, uh, we've recently released patch releases, uh, fixing some, um, you know, potential stability issues with 4.0 prior versions. And there are some new outstanding bug reports too, uh, that need to be sort of triaged and determined if they're critical. Um, the first thing as, so I, I'll speak on this a little, and then also just kind of get open feedback and just sort of listen. Um, the first thing is, yeah, with regards to 5.0, because it is intended to be a protocol upgrade, really, um, it is important for us to like plan well ahead um, and ensure that like um, we know when some of these things are going to land. And so that's, that's why we're talking about 5.0 already. Um, because actually like we've, we've been kind of mathing it out internally and realizing that um we're we're pretty much out of time <laughs> you know what i mean so uh that's you know internally at least like uh it, it's like right around the corner you know now the other aspect of this like why why is there any urgency at all it's in some ways it's an arbitrary date right like um the other aspect of this is that you know obviously the us network foundation doesn't have any direct uh controller influence over like when these things are actually rolled out uh and so that's, that's something that requires community coordination and can take uh some indeterminate amount of time to get done right and so you know the longer we delay um getting a release candidate and going through sort of the process of of um uh building confidence that those are rock solid and stable, you know, um, which in and of itself is going to be a period of time that this takes, right? Um, and then and then finally, the sort of coordination process of getting people, you know, upgraded and ready to go. And then finally, getting people to actually activate, um, you know, protocol features, right? Um, it's, a, it's a long uh, process. And at we're we're basically from a cadence perspective um the intention we have is to do uh two major releases a year one with no protocol uh upgrades required and one with any protocol upgrades required right so given that big sort of lead time that i just described right um if we have if we don't, what am I trying to say? If we have delays on that, right, um, it has the risk of pushing the next one uh, because it could take a lot of that window time, right, um, just just to get to that point. So it has the risk of potentially pushing the next one. And, you know, at some point it's, you know, less than two releases a year, which is already a kind of a minimal um, uh, relief. Go ahead. Uh, I think just to elaborate on my remark, uh, it was more about trying to minimize cost because at the end of the day, your server, no matter what you do in Node EOS, you still need the RAM and you still need like fast, potentially CPU and a lot of disk space. So all the optimization that I see happening are more like about how many, like the scaling of it, so to speak, like how many API servers you need to uh, run to be able to serve whatever uh, users uh, that connect you. So, but in terms of like, you know, as feedback to the comments uh, made by Michael, no, I like that we talk about five and introduce new features and test it as early as possible. Um, that for me makes a lot of sense because generally like S5 is being worked on and tested. Anything that's found is passion for, and you know, we're running kind of like for more or less, that'll be the stable until we get to uh, two five, so that's my two cents. 
Yeah, and and I understand what you're saying. The the, the context of your comment was around um, cost. The reason I went into this was because um, the reason that folks haven't necessarily yet reaped the benefits of Ford Auto is because many haven't actually uh, upgraded to Ford Auto yet, um, and which which was very relevant to Michael's comment. So that yeah, that all makes sense. Anyway, so I you know that's one perspective. One more piece of context I want to give, and then I kind of want to open for any any feedback on this, or you know, I'd love I'd love to get any insights on how folks generally feel about uh, everything I just said. Um, but one more bit of context is there are really two primary features targeted for 5.0 that are like we we really want to make sure they're in there. Right. Um, the first is the um, is the protocol upgrade feature uh, that we're targeting, which is instant finality. Um, so we really hope to have that in there, and we think that that one's important enough that, like, potentially, you know, this is this is Brian talking, not an official ES Network Foundation statement. Still need to like get you know people um, aligned, which might mean me moving on this, right? Um, but potentially delaying. 5.0 if that isn't ready right um most other things would not like if that's ready and other things are not we would ship it without the other things you get what i'm saying um so that's sort of the the cornerstone feature that we in, hope to include in 5.0 um and then the next one is um the we talked about the vmoc um features which pri the primary purpose of that is to offer performance benefits uh for the I thought you were going say that again uh I think, Lenny, yeah yeah sorry you might need to mute um um so the primary benefit of that is for um to offer speed benefits for the EOS EVM uh and uh you know but also it's it will make uh certain classes of computation more more efficient in general for uh nodes we were talking about producers correct because like, yeah so produce, might not already use it in some cases right so basically it applies oc for producers as well in certain scenarios um, but not in all scenarios. There's a um, uh, there's an issue, um, Kevin. I wonder if you could paste that link in into the chat so people could take a look at it. Um, it, it has a table, um, which which goes through sort of the conditions where OC would be applied now with producers as well. Um, anyway, so those the uh, those are the two like primary features that we hope uh, will will definitely be in um, 5.0. Um, others, that's more reason. Go ahead. I was just going to say that's definitely more reason to do it as soon as possible because with faster penalty, there's going to be a lot of synchronization between, you know, exchanges and making sure everybody is expecting it. Like a lot of, you know, user interfaces are, counting the blocks and versus, you know, checking what's the lid, you know? So like, I love this, like, uh, like giving people enough room to, to adjust, to basically make benefit of this, uh, you know, reduced wait time. Like it's not going to affect anybody's code in theory, but like it's just going to delay everything for if people are not aware of this change. Right. Um, now the headline here that, that I mentioned at the very beginning of this call is that there are other uh, items that are the work is continuing on them. They're they're being done in in um, in parallel, but they're um, candidates for potentially moving into a future release so as not to delay the 5.0 release, right? Um, and those those cornerstone features. Um, Anyway, I'm going to stop talking about this now and let other people give any additional context or feedback on release cadence stuff. I will have a question. Go ahead. 
Okay, I'll go. Um, so just just a little bit of yeah on, on the cadence side of things when it, when it comes to the consensus upgrades, what we found with the previous ones is that generally rule of thumb, giving two months from the time we have the final release and all the documentation nicely ready and an article, basically one that's all ready, we get the EO support guys to go start sending out emails and knocking on doors. And usually about two months is, is an appropriate amount of time to get everybody prepared for the consensus upgrade. Um, and I can also say I had a chat with Eve just to pick his brain. Is there any you know, strategic reasons to target any particular date for the activation? Um, and from, from Eve's perspective, really it's just, we want to avoid getting into the holiday season, so December and the Western side of things. And then we got Chinese new year, lunar year, kind of, in, I think in January, February. Um, so ideally the goal would be to activate but before the end of November, which gives us until September to get final release out and and all the documentation prepared and, and the comms going out. Right. So a lot to get done in a short amount of time. Um, the good news is that many of those things uh, are... Well, the things that are in, under my direct control <laughs> are, are pretty much done, uh, many of them, not all of them. Um, so uh, the biggest question mark that I'm that I'm digging into because I'm not directly involved in it is the most important feature, <laughs> which is instant finality. So uh, I've got some more digging to do to understand where that where that lies and whatnot. But um, but yeah, so that's the reasoning for the release cadence. It sounded like, I think, uh, Shaq, you had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if something has changed uh, regarding the OC since when it was first int introduced, because I do remember there was conversation about not to enable it uh, for a few reasons. One of those reasons was that I think history solutions won't be able to keep up or, or nodes to sync from start was going to be an issue to actually catch up. Like, I don't recall exactly, but I just wanted to know if these issues are no longer an issue because they're addressed in a different way or... Well, this is this is one of the reasons that we want to bundle it with a protocol upgrade release um, is because... The, so, for example, and maybe Kevin probably could speak more intelligently on this, but, like, for example, the... Um, the concern over history solutions um, is valid, but is only a problem if those history solutions are not running an updated version that that takes advantage of um, of OC uh, in this for the same set of transactions that a that the network in general is is doing. Right? Yeah, the concern at a it's high level. they are. Like because currently, like for example, in a in a normal deep use setup, you by default put your mind reader or, or like your node that is gonna you know consume the the block data is is already enabled with OC. Like that's a, the default setup without you even editing it. So now it's gonna have to keep up with much more. Like obviously, I didn't test any of this to know if it's an issue, but in theory, like because you know in, in deep use you could run like different nodes. And have them sync different parts and then just combine all the merge blocks, for example. So you can scale it that way to catch up. So if we have the same way for state history, where you might have, I don't know, multiple nodes and then kind of join the state history, that at least would resolve it for catching up as far as I can tell. Yeah, and the the biggest reason why that's potentially a risk is like what we call a, a ten thousand X uh sort of computational difference, right? Like um, it's, you know, orders of magnitude potential difference between the efficiency of OC versus baseline. Um, and that's also one of the reasons for the selective uh, usage of OC is that by only rolling it out for um, system contracts uh, and other very specific scenarios, like, like for example, um, uh, read-only transactions, right? Those sorts of things. Um, 
it's a more controlled rollout where we don't we don't have to worry about um abusive uh use where like people have them contract and yeah yeah a custom contract intentionally creating a 10,000x scenario right where it's uh something runs way faster on OC um by several orders of magnitude than on baseline and therefore creating uh these issues right so instead uh we we're limiting to more in the you know like 5x type of category right where it's it's significantly more performant um but not so much so that it uh uh creates an untenable situation right that's and the untenable situation will be only if in theory like ship is not using oc for example, and you're trying to uh, sync with a node or a producer that is doing OC. Because like some things, like you said, like read-only transactions, return values, if they're in read-only transactions, all those things like will definitely benefit from OC and potentially system contract uh, as well. Although like, I don't see why you, you can't even enable it for the rest. Uh, if you're saying now, as long as you're using an updated, you know, like your history solution is, is also enabling OC, which I assume here everybody does. Like, I don't know, like I don't really run a lot of state history except for testing, but I assume everybody runs their state history on, on OC, wouldn't they? And I won't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah that. that would be the, that would be the recommendation is that even today, everyone should be running OC, um, on, on their ship node, you know, um, it, it has you know, some of that has to do with like how many roles is your node playing, right? But yeah, definitely, if you've got a, a a node that's dedicated to ship, then yeah, absolutely, you should enable OC because there's no reason there's no reason not to. Um, the the same could potentially be said for um, a P two P node. Like if you had a node whose only job was to provide P two P relays and connections, um, then there's really no reason not to uh, enable OC on that node, unless that node is directly connected to your VP. Uh, and then you, know, you potentially don't want to run it uh, on that node. So what this what does, does change subjective billing and whatnot though, for your P2Ps, I mean, if you're receiving transactions, yeah, you're billing them yeah. differently because you got OC. So, I mean, but you know, like to be in the last three. Right. That's true. Yeah, and so there's like API uh, node would be like you know you wanted to match the producer as much as possible, assuming your hardware matches the producer. If your hardware is less capable, you might want to enable OC anyway. Like I don't think you have a serious solution for the subjective billing. Yeah, so right, so the subjective billing is is an issue. Now, if you've got a protection node, a canary node between you and your your BP, then you know that node can play the role of. Uh, with the subjective billing of, of, of protection there. Uh, and, you know, if that, that's the case, then you don't need the protection necessarily on, on the relay. All depends, uh, you know, of course, on, on your setup. The, one of the real benefits here with this auto OC, you know, talk, we can talk some more about the producer um, and issues that that might cause in terms of, like, security. And we can talk some more about that if you like. But, like, but let me just talk about one of the, the big benefits of, of this change is that is like running it, uh, this auto mode, which will be the default, uh, will be in place on your API node, which means on an API node, when you're running your um, uh, transactions, speculatively executing transactions that come through the API, the RPC endpoint, then those are run and will, and you know, the default without OC. And so that gives you like the equivalent sort of, of like billing capability so that you can report back to the user, you know, presuming same hardware, et cetera, et cetera, you know, something that is equivalent to what it should have on, on, on the BP. And so but but, you want, yeah, go ahead. But wouldn't you want the OC to be like, like say this auto mode, uh, that is set automatically, it should be the same, in my opinion, as the BP. So meaning that it's enabled for system contract, it's enabled for, you know, uh, whatever else like that, that will be enabled for in the BP. Otherwise the API will, you know, might report like a higher cost because it's not doing OC and not let the transaction pass, although the producer would have passed. 
So like the pop, the, the one, at least that the node that is connecting to your BP needs to match my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and then actually that is exactly the way it works. So for um, EOSIO dot star contract, so anything um, that's on an EOSIO system account um, uh, contract, so that's you know the system contract, that's the token contract. It's the EOS EVM contract, which is kind of key here. Uh, um, EOS IO wrap, multi-sig, all those, the contracts that are on an EOS IO account, then no matter where you're at, uh, on all nodes, they will use OC. And the rationale there being that those are all controlled accounts, um, well-tested and understood. And so they're not just a user-controlled accounts, they are system-controlled accounts. And so we're deeming it safe to run OC on all those accounts because the, the contracts are controlled. Is that so hard coded to EOSIO? What if they'd renamed their EOSIO contract? It, it's going to be hard coded to the config and the source code of system account, which is EOSIO. So if someone has modified their code base to change the EOSIO uh, system account name, then that, uh, and they merge this in, uh, assuming they do the merge correctly. Uh, then, yeah. yeah, then it, it will use that. It will use that config var variable. So it's not hard coded exactly to ESIO, although it's it's system account which is hard coded to ESIO at least in in our code base. So yeah, certainly someone can easily change that on a on a on a sister chain if they've if they've already done that and they want to continue to do that. Uh, otherwise, yeah, it, it's associated with that. We did discuss the pos possibility, and we could still discuss this as potential changes in the future, of adding a whitelist uh, capability. So instead of just saying ESIO, instead potentially have a uh, ability for, uh, say, block producers to multi-sig configure a, a set of contracts that 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 are whitelisted for, for OC. But for now, at least in this initial um, release that we're talking about, it'll, it'll be strictly for ESIO dot accounts. So of course, the big ones there, of course, are token, which token transfers, which are a, a large portion of what the chain does, right? And then of course, the other big one there is for EOS e EVM, right? So you get the, the speed up for EVM. And so that'll be across the board. So whether the account is, and whether block. it's, yes, it's, uh, on block. Uh, okay, on block's interesting. Uh, I have to go look at on block. Um, yeah, that's the uh, okay. I don't know off the top of my head. I'll, I'll go check that out. I I'm guessing yes, but I wouldn't swear to it at the moment. But yeah, let's make sure on block, it's um it's that as well. If not, I'll make sure that happens. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I'll make sure of that. Um, so um I, I think so because it should be ES, effectively ESIO system contract uh, in play there. So yeah, pretty certain that's true. But I'll verify. Uh, but yeah, so ESIO, and so that's across the board, whether it's the producer, whether it's the API node, what, no matter where uh, an ESIO.star contract uh, action executes, it should be an OC after this change. Uh, assuming you haven't explicitly disabled OC, which you can, you can still say um, tier up none, um, but the default will be auto. You can still use all, like if you're on a ship node, you still want to enable it for all contracts. Again, there's no reason not to. So after this change, um, you'd still be running it for all cases for ship. It's just for like API nodes, you get the benefit of, of executing it for the SIO account. But the other huge benefit, and this is across the board on every node that, that, that would be running this auto mode, it enables OC for applying the block. So when you receive a block, it would apply the block using OC, even though speculative execution is done on non-OC. Uh, so before nodes had like just basically on or off, right? Either all or none. Now it's going to um, um, smart, smartly apply OC according to these configurations. Now for a BP, it's a whole kind of different ball of wax. So the for a BP, we actually don't use OC when applying the block, and the reason is that we want on a BP. The state that is built on the OP uh, on the BP to be built using the non-OC WASM uh, instruction. So even applying the blocks on on the block producer will um, will use base what we call baseline or non-OC, except again for ESIO dot star account. So 
uh, even transactions on a BP and applying a block, those will, will scale up or, or uh, tear up to the OC. Um, and so now in terms of like to your question about um, does this have the potential for burying a ship node uh, on uh, out there that's enabled, got enabled OC, but the BP's also got enabled OC. Well, let's say it's the um, the worst case. Well, I don't know. It, it, let's have don't call it the worst case. Let's just say we have a scenario that every transaction for a month is on an ESIO account. It's either a token transfer or an EVM, right? The EVM became so popular that no one's doing anything else, and and that's all that's happening. So yes, in that scenario, you could imagine a, a situation where since the ship node is doing more work than a BP node, that it would have a difficult time um, maintaining its uh, in, uh, being in sync with the chain. I mean, that that is potentially a problem, but that's in some ways potentially a problem today, right? I mean, o even with OC enabled, it's not necessarily true that a ship node is going to be able to always keep up with the chain. Now, it, in general, it should be able to because, you know, you've, we've got chain parameters set where we're only using 200 uh, milliseconds out of the 500 milliseconds um, uh, uh, of time, of a block time. So that gives, you know, 300 milliseconds more time to a ship node in general, right? And those can be scaled, right? I mean, you can change the CPU effort percent to even scale that back more if you find that, you know, the, it, your BPs are too powerful, like they, they're just overwhelming the network. I mean, certainly as BPs, you have the potential for scaling that back um, with with settings that, that you already have. Which, uh, which version is the auto? Uh, it'll be in 5.0. Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. We are at 10 o'clock. Um, so we should probably cut it here. Just as a review, we talked about um, block log cor corruption, trying to prevent that, diagnose and recover from that. Um, and more specifically about the uh, usefulness of error messages uh, in leap Util and potential improvements there. I also talked about the release cadence for um, Leap. And, um, you know, we went into some detail on the ESVM OC changes coming in 5.0. With that, I'll hand it back to Daniel. Well, thank you. Um, great discussion. Have a great day. And friendly reminder, last day for Pomelo donations. So get your donations in on Pomelo if you're participating this season. Thank you, everybody.